and different. Um, thank you guys uh, for being here, those staff members that are here and our volunteers that's working our uh, live stream. We thank you for that. And it's so great to have you guys joining us um, online. My name is Micaela, and I'm the re director of discipleship and student ministries here at the church. And so um, I'm thankful that I get to be here with you guys today, uh, even if we have to keep things at a distance. Um, and what a week that we have had. I feel like um, since last Sunday, so much has changed in our world as we're trying to uh, adapt and to adjust. And uh, yesterday, Saturday morning, I attended my very first Zumba class online. Um, so that was new and different. Usually uh, I have to force myself to go and do my workout because there's the accountability of other people being there. But I was just in my you know, living room at home and I was like, well, I guess I have to motivate myself. But it was actually kind of cool to be able to do that um, over the airwaves. But uh, we've had uh, an interesting couple of days of trying to figure out in just one week how we're going to do this thing called church and how we're going to continue to be God's people and his community, even though we can't necessarily meet together. I mean, even the stage, we've tried to make sure that everybody's six feet apart and we don't have too many people in the space so that we can make sure that everybody's taken care of and everybody's safe. Um, and so needless to say, we have been walking through this sermon series talking about spiritual disciplines. And uh, the way the world looks today is vastly different from when I got assigned this topic um, many, many months ago. And so I've been thinking about that over the past couple of weeks, and we're doing this sermon series called The Walk by Pastor Adam Hamilton. And we've been talking about these five spiritual disciplines. And so far, we've covered worship and prayer, we've covered studying God's word, and we've covered serving. And now we get to cover everybody's favorite topic, giving. Yay. Yes. <laughs> it's always such a tough topic to, uh, to talk about. And you know, a lot of you guys know my story. I feel like I grew up, um, or basically I was born into the church. My mom uh, was the choir director at the church um, that she grew up in, and I feel like I was basically like born on the uh, piano bench next to her as she would lead the church in music. And so church and hearing sermons over the years, I feel like I have heard the giving message so many, many times. I mean, it's to the point where I know for a fact that tithing is a spiritual discipline that I'm supposed to have in my life, and I can quote the Bible verse about bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse, where it talks about that in Malachi, and I know that in that verse, uh, that's where God tells us that we can test him in that. It says that um, you can test him in this because basically he's giving us an opportunity to see how he's going to bless us. And so tithing is a spiritual discipline that I feel like I've had to work into my life because I've been hearing it and I've been taught that for so very long. And so it's kind of this automatic thing that I do. Um, but I can't be too automatic about it because then I also have heard the sermons about giving where it talks about God loves a cheerful giver. And so I can't let it be too automatic because I have to make sure that I'm giving cheerfully and I'm like, okay, Lord, this is yours and I'm giving it to you. Um, or when I am generous and give to other people. Um, and then, of course, I've also heard the sermons where it talks about your treasure and your heart and, and how those relate to each other. And that's what we're going to focus in on today. And so um, I know that from that verse that we're supposed to not be greedy, but uh, I feel like we all know these things. As humans that try to interact with other people, we try to make sure that we're not being greedy uh, towards other people. Now, a lot of you right now at home looking on Facebook are kind of glad we can't see how much toilet paper you have in your pantry because that's kind of been an issue as of late. But overall, we try as a people not to be greedy. And so uh, right now, as I'm preparing for this message, I was trying to think about, okay, Lord, but what does that mean now? What does that have to do with what we're going through in the here and now? Because all of those sermons, they make sense when the world isn't experiencing an actual pandemic. But now we're having to take these drastic measures and we're having to stop the spread and flatten the curve. And I was really wrestling with, Lord, how does this whole idea about our treasure and our hearts, what does it have to do with us today in the here and now? 
And so I struggled with that and I wrestled with it, but we're still going to dive into the scripture um, that we've been given for today because as a person who's grown up in the church, I truly believe that God's word does not return void. And so I'm believing that as we work through this scripture today, that God still has a message for us in the midst of that. And so as we dive in, we're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. And it's important for us to remember that Jesus is the one who's speaking in this, uh, in this scene that we're going to dive into. And so it starts off in verse 19, and it says this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Now this I feel like is kind of a classic verse. It's this idea that we should not overvalue the collections that we have, the collections of things and our earthly possessions, and we're not supposed to overvalue money. But um, but as we continue to read, we get a better understanding of what that means. And so in verse 21, it says this, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And it also says in other translations, where your treasure is, that's also where your heart is. And so the desires of our heart are directly related to the value, the things that we value the most in our lives. As a matter of fact, our heart and what we value and what we treasure is located in the same exact proximity within us. But an important part of studying God's word and learning more about what he has to say to us is understanding the full context of his words. And so we're going to continue reading in verse 22. It says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. So now, Jesus, as he's speaking, he's giving us this word picture using our eyesight and how our eyes guide the way that we move and do things in our lives. And so when we set our sights on healthy things, our bodies respond accordingly. But at the same time, when we set our sights on the unhealthy things, our bodies also respond accordingly. And so Jesus here is reinforcing the idea that when we treasure the right things, our hearts are positioned correctly. And when we treasure the wrong things, our hearts are not in a place where they are supposed to be. And so in verse 24, we continue. It says, no one can serve two masters, for you will... For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So now, Jesus, he takes it a step further and he explains that we don't get to have it both ways. When it comes to money and our possessions, we have to choose whether they are the priority or if God is actually the priority in our lives. We cannot prioritize both. But then as we continue in the scriptures, Jesus kind of switches gears as he's talking and teaching. He switches gears because usually we kind of separate these two passages and we think about them as one and the other. But we're going to kind of put them together today and it continues saying in verse 25, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat and what will we drink? What will we wear? 
These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And so Jesus here, he goes into this beautiful description of how God, he even takes care of the lilies in the field and the wildflowers. And so therefore he's going to take care of us. And then he finishes it off with the instruction that we are to seek God's kingdom first and not to worry about our future. But what stuck out to me here is that when you look at those in context together, Jesus initially, he started talking about greed. He started talking about the ways that we have a tendency to, to kind of compile our worldly possessions. And we, we start to treasure these earthly things that are not going to last. But then he ends talking about worry. And I don't usually put those two things together, but the more that I was thinking about it, the more I saw how greed and worry tend to go hand in hand. And, and this week to me is a prime example of that because the definition of greed is an excessive desire for more of something. Now, I think in general, we all try not to have that excessive desire for just more and more things, but I feel like all of us at some point have said things like, if only we had more hours in the day. There's just never enough time for me to do all the things that I have to do. And then who among us hasn't said something where we're like, just a little bit more money would help me accomplish this or do that. I could finally paint the house, or I could finally buy that game system that I've always wanted, or I could finally go on that vacation that I've always dreamed about. And then here's one that kind of sneaks up on us, because it's, that it's when we're thinking, it's not that I don't need to be in control of the situation, it's just that I want it done correctly. But we have a tendency to get greedy about our time and our money and our control over things. But that desire for more time and for more money and more control, it manifests itself as worry in our lives. And worry is unfortunately something that we're a little bit too familiar with in this day and age because we worry about everything under the sun and we try to play it off. Yesterday, um, I saw a post on social media and it said this. It said, reminder, when you're anxious, you use extra mental and physical energy. This is why you might be finding it hard to stay focused, do as much as usual, and get motivated. So please stop being so hard on yourself. And I don't know about you, but that was me this entire week because it felt like the walls kept closing in. Every few seconds it felt like the CDC was coming out with another new guideline for how we're supposed to live our lives in order to remain safe. And so I'm sitting at my desk trying to get done all the things that need to be done, and then I'm going, I wonder why I can't focus. I can't seem to get anything together. I can't seem to gather my thoughts. Everything is scattered. And it's because I was so worried about everything else that was going on. But that's why Jesus, in verse 25, says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Which is awesome in theory, but I feel like that's one of those things that's a little bit easier said than done. Because lately, the types of things we've had to worry about have started changing. It's, will I get sick if I go to the grocery store? Do I have enough food and supplies to last for me and my family if there's a shelter in place order placed in my community? Is there enough water in my house? How am I going to homeschool my kid when the teachers have a hard enough time schooling my kid in school? How am I going to pay my bills if everybody is under quarantine? So there's all these worries that we start to have because of the things that are out of our control. And so our minds, they start shifting from the heavenly treasures where they're supposed to stay. And we start to think about the other things that are with, outside of our tangible control. But we have to remember that when we start to treasure those other things, our heart, it gets pulled in a different direction also. When we start to shift our, our priorities, our heart also goes with it. And so before long, instead of our treasure and our heart being focused on God and the kingdom of God, they're focused on all of 
the other worries that we have today. But I think that's why Jesus keeps repeating himself as he's teaching in the scripture. Because he keeps repeating himself and he says, so don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. Seek first the kingdom of God, the place where worry is unnecessary because in God's kingdom, he is in control and we don't have to worry about the things of today. We don't have to allow that to take over us because we're not in control anyway. And I think weeks like this are when we realize that the most. Seek first the kingdom of God because that's where our treasure is supposed to be. That's where our hearts are supposed to be. They're supposed to be where God is. And when our treasure lies in the kingdom of God, our hearts can have peace. And I don't know about you, but right now, in the here and now, our world is experiencing all of this different kinds of craziness. And so I feel like my heart needs to be located somewhere safe and where better than in God's kingdom. And so when everything is uncertain, the fact that God is king and in control means that I don't have to be. And when my natural inclination is to worry about what life is going to look like three months from now, or three weeks from now, or three days from now, I don't have to worry about that because I'm seeking God's kingdom first. Because that's where my treasure is. That's where my value is. That's where my priorities are. The important things that I need to be thinking about are located in the kingdom of God. And so that's why he instructs us to set our eyes on those things, to have our eyes on the healthy things, the things of God's kingdom, because our eyes light the way for us. And so my greatest desires need to be focused in on God. So you want to talk about spiritual disciplines and the things that we're learning how to do. I feel like this is a tough one because the other spiritual disciplines we've been talking about, worship and prayer and study and service, those are all things that we can kind of add to our calendar and eventually our bodies will start to catch up. But treasuring the kingdom of God, that to me is a workout. That to me is a stretch because it means pushing aside worry so that we make room for God's provision. It means pushing aside all of my thoughts, my concerns, so that I have space for God to do what God is going to do. And so from here on out, when I read that scripture, when I think about the word treasure, I'm not going to think about it necessarily in the terms of money and possessions, because now I'm changing my focus. And so treasure for me is God's kingdom. From here on out, when we see this verse, and when we understand that, we're going to be thinking on the things of God. This kingdom where Jesus says the king will give us exactly what we need. And what I love about that is that when we allow God to give to us exactly what we need, when we allow him to do that, we get rid of the things that we think we need. We get rid of the things that we think we want, and we actually get what God knows that we need. We create space for him to give to us, and then in turn, we can give to other people. Because when God, in anxiety-riddled situations, gives us peace in the midst of the storm, you can in turn give that peace to someone else. And when God gives us joy because that's exactly what we need in any given situation, then we have an opportunity to give that joy to someone else. And when God gives us hope because we can't see what's going to happen days from now, we can also in turn provide that hope for somebody else. Because when he gives, we can give as well. And so when our hearts are in the right place, when we have that proper positioning of receiving from God, we can give to others. It means we've set our sights on what actually matters. It means we're not going to be greedy about the worries and the control and the time and the money that we're always concerned about. It means we've set our sights on God and he's going to give us exactly what we need. 
And we can trust that God still knows what our needs are, even in the midst of our constantly changing world. And so that means that if I'm not worrying about myself and my needs, then there's plenty of room to think of others. I was talking to my friend. She uh, is a missionary. She lives in Spain. Her name is Lily. And, uh, and so she was kind of giving me her perspective on what's going on over there. And my friend Lily, I have always felt, has the spiritual gift of faith. Now, we all have faith, but Lily has the spiritual gift of faith to where any circumstance that comes her way, she's absolutely able to completely turn that over to God. And so as we're exchanging stories and talking about how the world is changing, every time she told me about a challenge that she's experiencing in Spain because of the way the world is today, she immediately followed it up with a way that God is encouraging her or a way that God is allowing her to still see his sovereignty in the midst of this storm. And so what I realized is that in talking to her, what God gave to her, she also gave to me as an encouragement because her testimony became my hope. And her way of seeing through the darkness became the way that I can understand that God's going to see me through darkness as well. And so the peace that God gives her also became my peace. And we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but scripture tells us that that's not for us to worry about. Because we serve a God who is in charge and who knows exactly what we need. And so when we start to think about the things that worry us, my encouragement to us today is to focus in and treasure God's kingdom, treasure God, because that's where we're going to get exactly what we need. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray that in the midst of everything that's going on, you would allow us to seek you first, to understand that you have peace to give us, that you can calm our storm, that our anxieties and our worries are things, Lord, that you can contend with in the moments when we don't feel like we can. So God, right now I pray for everybody that's in this room and everybody that's joined us online, God, that you would meet them exactly where they are in their place of need. Give to them so that they can give to others, God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I serve a risen Savior.